Hello everyone and welcome back to Talking Pictures where we explore the films, genres, actors, directors, and so on that people love. Today the topic is silent films. More specifically, we're going to be talking about pre-feature cinema and mainstream Hollywood dramas. My guest and discussion mate today will be the creator and runner of MoviesSilently.com, which is home to accessible silent movie reviews. She also makes silent movie posters of modern or at least post-silent era films. Films. She writes lists, she writes humorous posts, she occasionally produces video reviews, and one of my favorite things that she does is that she does side-by-side -side comparisons of silent films and their talking remakes. She is the wonderful, the fabulous, the unbelievably knowledgeable Fritzy Kramer. Fritzy, thanks for being with me today. Oh, thanks for having me. How do you define a silent film? film because i think some people think of it just as the stuff that was made in between kind of 1880 and 1890 to the late 1920s but then there was some stuff like i think you mentioned sean the sheep you considered mm -hmm. a silent film so i mean how how do you define the silent film a silent film is a is a movie that tells the story visually because some people get caught up in the title cards and think that that's what makes a silent movie but actually title cards were seen as a bit of a nuisance and there were some directors who actually tried to avoid them as much as possible. And that's why I count Shaun the Sheep as a silent movie, because even though the characters will make those, you know, sort of Ardman animation noises where they go, oh, oh, or something like that, all the communication, all the storytelling is told through gestures, through musical cues, and through visible character interactions. And so that would be my definition. Do you remember the first time you saw what you would define as a silent film? Well, I thought it was Sparrows from Mary Pickford from 1926. But then I remembered, I don't know if you've seen these, but there was this weird thing they did in like the 60s or 70s where they took the old Mutt and Jeff cartoons that were silent and they traced over them and colored them in and then added this really funky, like very 60s, 70s music to them. And so I saw those and they had inner titles and everything, but I kind of forgot about them. And then I decided that I wanted to expand my movie knowledge to before 1930. So I rented Sparrows with Mary Pickford and I hated it because the tape was really warped and they'd had this organ score. And because the tape was warped, the organ score was warped. I mean, this is the days of VHS, but then I gave it another chance and I watched City Lights with Charlie Chaplin. And that's really the movie that won me over. How old were you exactly when you started to kind of explore these pre-1930s movies? I think I was like 19. You said City Lights won you over. What was it about that that kind of grabbed your attention and made you kind of get into it more? Charlie Chaplin, he really, he really gets to me. I just, I love the way he's able to not only create humor and tragedy, but also he has this depth of character. There's never just the girl, the boy, that sort of thing in his films. I mean, not to bash comedians who do that, but there's something really wonderful that there's, you feel like all of the characters have like this inner life. And that was what was so beautiful about that film. And it's completely absorbing. Like it just pulls you in. And because there's no dialogue to distract you, it kind of hits you kind of in that, in this place where it's between the reaction to a really good movie and a really good novel where it, it engages your imagination. So it was actually like the perfect film to get me hooked on it. Is there anything else about the kind of uh, style of silent films that you love and, and admire? One of the main things I love is that with silent films, a lot of them were made before there was the formal studio system. The studio system arose during the silent era. So they would cover topics that modern studios or studios of the 30s would never dream of of covering or they'll have these like really off kilter and oddball stories because there's no one there to tell them that you can't make a movie about this or that for example there's where are my children which is about birth control and abortion which very hot topic hot button political issues today and here you have them covering this in a mainstream studio film which is pretty surprising and then the other example i like to say is cecil b demille had an independent studio in the mid-20s to late 20s and 
he put out these absolutely insane movies and a lot of them were written by women. So you had this sort of unique perspective and some of them were actually quite empowering. I mean, some of them weren't, of course, but some of them had like very forward heroines and they passed the Bechdel test with flying colors and all that good stuff. So it, there's like this kind of maverick feel to it that's really, really interesting. I'm glad you brought that up because I think one of the things I love about silent films and particularly the very early ones, like the late 19th century, early 20th century ones, I don't think any other era of film experiments as much with the medium of film mm -hmm. there's those early ones like the george malia's films and stuff like that which are just not something you anybody i think would make today at right. all and they just have this great experimentation going on do you find silent films do you think that they're accessible for modern audiences because it seems like there's often seems to be backlash against them from people who try to approach them there's this weird thing with silent films where a lot of people who have never seen one or perhaps only have seen part of one consider themselves experts. So they'll come off with this bizarre stuff that never really happens in them. They're like, oh, those are the ones where women get tied to the tracks and everyone throws pies. And I'm like, well, no, not really. And so I think that's a problem. And I think another problem is that some film history teachers want to shove something like birth of a nation down everyone's throats and here you have a love letter to the kkk which makes people understandably uncomfortable so you know that's not going to encourage people to want to come back and then they'll show battleship potemkin but it's almost always the soviet reissue which is slowed down and has a shostakovich score which is in itself an awful thing and so people have this image of them as being racist and boring and dull and dreary and so you get a lot of that in there too. But if you show people, like for example, I was just showing the Kid Auto Races at Venice, which is Charlie Chaplin, back to Chaplin, his first tramp, the first appearance of the tramp character on the screen. And there were people there who were not silent film fans, but they were watching like they were hypnotized. He just draws them in. And I've heard people say the same thing about Buster Keaton, or they'll see Theda Berra, for example, has seems to have that appeal to a lot of viewers, even though so few of her films survive. Louise Brooks. So I think it's just a matter of matchmaking, because if you don't like, for example, comedy or action films or a particular genre with modern film, you may not like it with silent film either. And silent film was made over such a long period and covers so many genres that People really owe it to themselves to try several different kinds from several different eras just to kind of find the one that appeals most to them. So I guess the short answer is, yes, it, they are very accessible. You just need an open mind and a high quality release or best of all, if you can go and see a live one. But I know that's not an option for everyone. Was there anything lost when talkies came around? Something that the silent films had that we have never seen again? I mentioned before the level of absorption. Because with talking pictures, all the information is fed to you. You become a passive viewer, whereas silent films require you to be an active viewer. And they stimulate the brain a little more, in my opinion, which is why I have heard some newcomers say that silent films give them a headache or make them tired because you're using a part of your brain that you're not used to using when you're looking at a screen. So I think that was lost. And also I'm in a weird position because I think the code had a lot of stupid rules and regulations, but I'm not a huge fan of pre-code films because I think a lot of it was just being naughty for the sake of being naughty. And they, they have like this sort of unfocused feel to them. Many of them do. I mean, I do like some, but many of them just don't feel cohesive to me. So I think that was lost. And also a lot of genres of the silent film that worked really well for years didn't work so well when the talkies came out. Most famously, there's that old story about John Gilbert where supposedly he had a funny voice when in fact what he had was a very melodramatic romantic story that would have been okay as a silent film, but it's a talkie and also he was overpronouncing his lines because he was nervous and so it was kind of this perfect storm of bad. And so I guess I kind of miss the sort of unabashed romanticism because movies became very cynical in the 30s. And I mean, that's way over generalizing because there were cynical movies before and there were also naive movies in the 30s. But generally speaking, they lost a little bit of that magic, I guess. It kind of leaves me cold.
Well, one of our topics today is pre-feature films. When we say pre-feature films, what kind of era are we talking about here? I count it as 1895, which was the year of the first projected films, up to, and this is kind of weird, the first feature film was in 1906 in Australia that we know of. But I'd say around 1912 to 1914 was when the American film industry started to switch over. Because before then, they had Nickelodeon theaters. Starting in like the early 1900s, they had the Nickelodeon theaters where they would, instead of playing one long movie, they would play a series of several short movies, about 10 to 20 minutes apiece. And then even before that, movies were even shorter where they'd be like a minute or two minutes. So basically anything that's in that date range, like 1895 to 1912 or so. I know you try to push pre-feature films a bit on your sites. Why do you like kind of emphasizing those? It's actually fairly uncharted territory. I mean, there are quite a few people who are covering them, but not nearly as many as the feature length silent films and even fewer who are covering classic sound films. And it's really important because you see the true basis of where everything begins. Because one of my pet peeves is people saying D.W. Griffith invented everything. And when you look at pre-feature cinema, you're like, no, the close-up was here. And, you know, the point of view shot was there. So he didn't really invent this and this and that. And also, as I said before, there's like this maverick quality to the silent features. And it's there in spades in the early films. There's just these perfectly mad pictures, especially the one we're going to discuss later, where the British early films, they're kind of almost on par with Monty Python. They're extremely surreal. So there's just kind of this, I guess you'd say, merry madness to them that's very appealing. And they're short. So that's nice, too. You can watch like 20 films in an hour. Are there any particular directors of pre-feature films that you think stand out? Well, Melies, of course. But also there's James Williamson, who was a British director. And then there's there's George Albert Smith. He directed Grandma's Reading Glass, England. And that's a really cute one. It's like a little boy takes his grandmother's magnifying glass and is looking at all the interesting stuff that he can find. And then Edwin S. Porter. And he's pretty much known for The Great Train Robbery. But he really had some absolutely wonderful films like Dream of the Rarebit Fiend. It's this sort of pioneering, surreal, psychedelic picture. And it's a great deal of fun. And then Cecil Hepworth in England. I, I do tend to favor the English and the French for the pre-feature stuff. And his were more grounded in reality, I think. But he really made some very charming films. You said that you really like to talk about mainstream Hollywood dramas. When I was originally talking to you about doing this, you said that they tend to be overlooked by European films and American comedies. Why do you think that is? It's several factors. After the silent era, silent comedy pretty much became the main thing people saw and the dramas were seen as only fit for heckling and they would actually just make fun of them and that's how a lot of people always saw them so there's this huge barrier to get over i think there was a show in the 1960s called fractured flickers where they would take a silent drama and play it at the wrong speed and add comical narration and I mean, there's nothing wrong with making fun of movies. I love mystery science theater. But the problem is, is that this is the only way a lot of silent dramas were shown. So people have this impression of silent dramas as being sort of something you can't take seriously. Whereas comedies, you're supposed to laugh, so they're okay with it. And then so many of the films that are on the best list are European. And I mean, nothing against it. You, there are some absolutely brilliant European films. But I think there is this definite prejudice against the mainstream Hollywood dramas. Invariably, people will say, oh, it, like Lubitsch was never as good after he went to Hollywood or, you know, things of that nature. And I'm not sure if this is like innate snobbery, like these are the people who are going to say they prefer European films in all contexts or if there's something else to it. But yeah, there's a definite it's, it's like pulling teeth to get people to watch a mainstream Hollywood drama. Comedy is a much easier sell. One of my pet peeves about silent films is that they are entirely filled with actors who are just overacting or who are just being melodramatic when that's really not the case. I mean, there are right. probably more subtle performances in silent films than I think you, can, you see in most talking movies. I almost think that people have this idea of particularly, I mean, to an extent, comedies too but i mean i think particularly silent dramas is being very over gestured and really almost silly melodrama i almost wonder if that maybe is kind of a barrier that people just have this idea of these dramas as just being over the top and ridiculous 
Yeah, I think that is the case. And I believe it was Kevin Brownlow who pointed out that when they were making melodramas, because, you know, let's be honest, there were some melodramas coming out of Hollywood. It was a popular genre, but they knew they were overacting like it was a particular style. They would be shocked that people wouldn't realize that they were playing it slightly tongue in cheek. They're like, it, but it's hokum. This is how we're supposed to do it. And so I think that's another problem is that people aren't as sensitive to the the layers of the performances and the different types of performances because there were some silent films that did have bad performances. I mean, every era has its bad actors, but I don't think people allow themselves to open themselves up to a different style. And also you have to keep in mind that the stories were often bigger in silent films. And so you need to play it bigger. For example, I'm thinking about how in the Star Trek TV shows, they preferred to cast Shakespearean actors and stage actors because with the makeup and the sets and the big storylines, they needed more. And television actors couldn't always deliver that more for them. And so that's what we're dealing with with silent films, where there were times when they needed more. But it was usually within balance of the genre of the film. There were very subtle performances. There were intentionally broader performances. And there were some bad performances. But for the most part, they were doing some very complicated stuff. And I think some of the earlier, bigger performances, I'm sure, were... I'm talking probably the stuff that was made in the 1900s and stuff. It was probably partially a holdover from the theater just because mm-hmm. you had to do bigger performances in the theater because you right. have to let people from the nosebleed seats know what you're doing i'm sure that bled into it a bit until they realized oh we have we can do a close-up if we want to we don't necessarily have to do these broad things all the time no it's true like if you look at the stars of the earlier film for example florence lawrence who is considered to be one of the first movie stars ever she does play broadly but She's very appealing. And at that point, they weren't using dramatic close-ups nearly as often as they would in the later silent era. So pretty much she had to assure that her performance projected through when they were doing like medium shots and long shots all the time. And also they had to move their faces in a way that would be seen from further back. And so there's a lot to it. And the other problem is, is that people tend to mash down the entire silent era into one big glob when in fact it lasted for 35 years and there's an enormous difference between the performances in 1895 and the performances in 1929. And also, there was extreme variation even within the same year. For example, I just watched a movie from 1913 called An Unsullied Shield, directed by Charles Braben, where basically it was just medium shots and long shots the whole time, no dramatic close-ups, and they just sort of set the camera down and started cranking. And then you compare it with Suspense, directed by Lois Weber and released the same year, where she had split screen, dramatic close-ups, really interesting angles and shots and point of view shots, and she was doing all this really crazy cutting and cool stuff and they were in the exact same year so you'll see that throughout the silent era where there are people that were still stuck in the past and generally speaking they didn't last if they couldn't keep up with the technology but you do see some throwbacks now and again where you're like uh they kind of need to you know, get with the times here. So that's another thing to remember is that something you see may be cutting edge or it may be completely stuck in the last decade. So to get to some of the suggestions that you have, because I did ask you to suggest some films to us today, you had one, a pre-feature film that you wanted to recommend. What was that? It's The Big Swallow, directed by James Williamson, and it lasts, I think, all of a minute. And it's about a guy who does not want his picture taken. And so he approaches the camera and opens his mouth and then we're shown the cameraman falling in and then it, the shot pulls back and he clearly enjoyed his snack. So it's I like it because it's like something Terry Gilliam would, would make. That's a very good comparison. Oh, and for the people who are curious, you can find it on YouTube. But I didn't know anything about this film, so I didn't know what to expect. And like we were talking about earlier, it's a very strange little minute of film and something that you don't see people doing. I mean, Terry Gilliam is, I think, a very good example of a modern person who's doing something 
sort of like this. But it's just it's just so strange, but also I think just really, really wonderful in its weirdness and its experimentation with the point of view of the camera. Which didn't James Williamson I was reading, didn't he experiment with that a little bit? Or was that like a one time thing for him? Uh, no, he was pretty adventurous. I mean, I haven't seen a ton of his work because a lot of these early films are lost, but he was definitely an experimenter. But I don't think he ever did anything as strange as this again, although, you know, someone can correct me if, if I'm wrong and if they know of a weirder one, I would very much like to hear about it. I was reading a little bit about this film for our talk. I know one critic was talking about, he said that they thought the shots of the cameraman being eaten by the guy's mouth, that that was almost a kind of a cheat within the concept of this little short. I was wondering if that, does that bother you at all or are you kind of fine with that? You know, that guy, he doesn't sound like he's going to be very fun at parties. He's like, well, actually, it's, it's not logical. <laughs> I, I, I'm i sorry. I was so charmed by the concept that I didn't sit and think, wait, where was the other camera? And what, this is ruining the point of view. And this, is, it's just overthinking it. And I think it's taking something that's charming and innovative and experimental and sort of killing it with overthought. It's like, I think someone said about jokes, where if you dissect a joke, it's like dissecting a frog where you find out how it works, but it doesn't do the frog any good. And that's the case in this film. It is just a wonderful little thing. And does it really need to be dissected and overthought over? I mean, I get his complaint, but I, at the same time, just enjoy the thing. It's a guy eating a camera, for Christ's sake. It's not anything to be... Over yeah. The about. Yeah, they were just having fun. They were saying, "Hey, let's try this," and it worked great. So, yeah, that that's what I think of it. We also have a mainstream drama that you wanted to recommend. What was that? It's a Barbed Wire from 1927 with Paula Negri and Clive Brook and Clyde Cook which I just realized rhymes. And it's about a French woman whose brother is sent to war. And then the French government shows up and they're like, hi, we're putting a POW camp in your backyard. And she's not too happy about that. And it's her learning to deal with the German POWs and sort of getting over her hatred of them and her thoughtless support of the war. And then, of course, she falls for one of the POWs because he's played by Clive Brook. Yeah, this was my first, I think it was, well, it was definitely my first Negri film. So this was a new experience for me. And I had seen Clive Brook in one film, in a talkie, which was horrible, but... Yeah, he, he made some stinkers. So the two lead actors, very kind of mostly new to me. But what I really liked about Negri is that, again, like we were kind of talking about, she's very... I mean, there's a couple gestures, I think, that she could have toned down. But for the most part, she's very subtle and just mm -hmm. very believable in what she's doing and i was really kind of drawn in by her performance i think she's often described as having an earthy quality where she just sort of throws herself in and i think another unappreciated aspect of her performances is that she's actually quite a generous co-star because there are some actors like john barrymore or lillian gish where if you don't fight for your scenes with them they will blow you off the screen without remorse Whereas Paula was more inclined to share, which is funny because she kind of had the reputation of being a bit of a diva, but it's very appealing. You're not going to get blasted off the screen with her. It's more teamwork. One of the things I liked about the fact that, that you recommended this film is the message of the film. It's a very timely message of not prejudging people by race, not saying, oh, we're at war with these people, therefore they're utter incomplete monsters. Baz Rathman talked about this in his autobiography, and Tolkien talked about this. He has a passage in The Two Towers where he talks about how basically you're somebody going to war, and I think you automatically assume that these people you're fighting against are just kind of these evil creatures, but then you really think about it is that they're probably somebody not unlike me who's fighting for something they believe in. They're fighting for their country. They might not have wanted to go to war at all. And there's just mm -hmm. really kind of humanizes the other and i think this film really kind of shows that as well and i really really enjoyed that aspect of it no it's true and hollywood actually had a lot to answer for because during the war the anti-german propaganda was just insane i mean like literally insane for example there's that infamous scene in the heart of humanity from 1918 where eric von stroheim tears off a red cross's nurse's uniform with his teeth and then throws a baby out the window and you're just like oh my god this is craziness and then as a lot of german talent was introduced to hollywood after the war i think a lot of them felt a little cheesy about having done that and so they're actually 
quite a few of these films being made where they showed the German point of view, you know, most famous being All Quiet on the Western Front. But yeah, and I liked that they had that nice little scene where Clive Brook talks about how he had actually worked in Paris before the war. And you could tell that he liked his job. He liked working in Paris. He wished he was still working in Paris and there was no war. And Paul and Avery's character is not ready to accept the fact that he's a human. And so there's this really good conflict going on there. I think one thing that was good about this film is that it gave time for her to warm up to him and some of the others. She doesn't just within 10 minutes of the movie dislike these people. It takes her quite a bit of time to really get to know these people and connect with them and realize that they're not unlike her and her father and the other people she knows. Yeah, they did an excellent job of it. And they also play up, well, I guess they would have called it shell shock in those days. We we call it post-traumatic stress, but they would call it shell shock where they're kind of you know, so many changes, they go from civilian to soldier to prisoner. And I think they did a good job of establishing that with the Germans as well, because you had Clyde Cook's character, who's the comedy relief, but even he doesn't really overdo it. You can see that he's just trying to make the best of a terrible situation because there was a tendency in silent films to sometimes let the comedy relief take over the film. But again, I think they had a really nice balance here where he's trying to cope by being the class clown, which is clearly how he copes with stress. And then you have Clive Brook, who's a little more brooding and depressed about it. So they show different reactions to the situation they're in. You know, I didn't think about that. I mean, and that's a really good point of view on Cook's character, because I found him, and just to be clear to anybody listening to this, I really enjoyed the film but i did find the comedy relief a bit to me was a bit intrusive Mm -hmm. i thought and i probably would have preferred and i get i mean i get i mean the point you brought up it's a great one it's also the idea of having a purely dramatic film can be very hard to maintain because you don't want to totally depress the audience so i get reasons why it it can be in there and why it can be a positive thing but it didn't quite work for me personally yeah i i really like clyde cook he was he did some solo short films and then he did he was comedy relief again in the winning of barbara worth but some of them oh my gosh like george k arthur i just i see him and i'm like kill him just kill him just kill him you know if he enters the screen was he the one in that really bad or wizard of oz movie that you hate oh no 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 he was in one called the boob and it was so bad that it got William Wellman fired from MGM and he deserved it <laughs> it had um Joan Crawford and oh my god and I wanted to kill him and then I saw him in Her Sister from Paris and I wanted to kill him again and then I saw him for like in a 10 second cameo and show people and I was like I'm like where is my baseball bat you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh that man someone told him he was funny they should have been mm. Anyway, now I know one thing about this film. One, it is based off a book that which was published a few years before a movie came out, and the book I cannot remember the name of it. It's not called it's not called Barbed Wire, but I can't remember the name no, of it. No, I I think it's called the the Woman of Nakalo. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that quite right because you know British place names and British place spellings are not always quite you know. But yeah, yeah, it's based in England instead of France, and there are several other differences, most notably the ending, but no spoilers here. Actually, I'm glad you brought the ending up, and we're not, we're not going to go into what the ending is and all that stuff, but I do want to ask you, do you like the fact that they changed the ending? I felt the ending of the book was self-indulgent, and that they went for what they thought was the more artistic ending, instead of actually being true to human nature. I didn't buy it. I just didn't buy it. Whereas in the movie, I think it was a little Hollywoodized, but I felt it was truer to the characters. Was there anything else about the film that you wanted to mention? I don't know if we've brought this up before in the conversation, but it's gorgeous. There's some really beautiful cinematography in there. For example, much looking through frosty window panes and just this very nice, moody, shadowy cinematography without going heavily German on it. So I would definitely recommend it if you wanted to share more of like the low-key beauty of a mainstream Hollywood film, because there are some that are like super flashy and super in your face with it. And I don't know that I'm an enormous fan of that style. So I kind of appreciate the sense of place and the sort of understated beauty of barbed wire. 
Oh, and I had a question. Paula Negri, sometimes her reputation gets overwhelmed by people get obsessed with who she dated because she dated Chaplin, she dated Valentino. And some people expect like a vamp, a raging vamp in the movies. Were you surprised by her performance or was it about what you expected? Or I'm just a little curious because I'm spearheading the Paula Negri revival here. I don't know if I really had much of an idea of what to expect with her. I know that she has her ardent fans. I know you're a big supporter of hers. But I was so, I mean, I, I mean to be honest, I was so unfamiliar with her that I really didn't have an idea of what to expect with her. I guess I was just hoping that it was a good performance. And the only negative I could maybe say about her, and I'm very positive about her in this film because I think she does a colossal job, but I guess it took me a while to warm up to her, I suppose. I think that's partially because, and maybe this is just my imagination, but her character doesn't get a lot to do at the beginning of the movie. I mean, she's, right. she's doing stuff, but they focus a bit more on the Germans, and she's just kind of there, kind of observing every now and then. It takes a while for her to, get, I think, get more actively involved in the movie. So, mm -hmm. it, But that's, you know, not... I think she's doing a bad job. It's more just that they're not showing her mm -hmm. off very much. For the most part, she's just really, really good. And I think, and I keep coming back to this, but if people want to see a great example of subtle, silent movie acting, I think they should come to this movie and watch her performance specifically because she's just a great example of doing very small things with her body and her face, but totally communicating exactly what her character is thinking and going through. And I think if you're going to come to this film for anything, you should come to it for that. Oh, yeah. I'm glad you liked her because it's actually, there's sort of a mini revival going on right now with her because there have been several of her American films that have been restored and they've been making the rounds at the film festivals. And people are saying, wow, how did I not know how great she was? And I'm like, yeah, see, see. And so I'm glad that you you liked her performance because a lot of people criticize her without seeing anything she was in because they decide they didn't like how she acted at Valentino's funeral. And I'm like, well, please submit pictures of yourself at all you funerals you've attended and we'll judge you but it, it's just it's nice to see a silent film actor who was judged by ancient gossip is now being judged and praised for the performances that she put on the screen is this movie and the performance she gives in that movie is that the typical quality of performance that people can expect from her work I think so. In some of her earlier stuff, for example, um, The Wildcat, she did with Lubitsch, it's a farce. So she's playing it broad because it literally looks like Dr. Seuss designed the film. So, you know, that's what we're dealing with. But another really good performance from her that's similar to this, but in a more comedic vein, would be A Woman of the World, where she plays a countess who comes to America and has to deal with midwest americans with their very european ways you know she smokes she has a tattoo my god we'll all die so yeah i think it's pretty typical of her quality she was a very versatile performer she could do comedy she could do drama she could do just about everything but this is one of her best films in my opinion my understanding, I don't have the box office numbers, so this should be taken with a grain of salt because sometimes things get started before people look at the numbers. But my understanding is that when she came to America, the returns on her films at Paramount were not as high as they had hoped, given her fame. But she definitely was extremely famous because... You know, she dated famous guys. She walked around with a leopard on a chain. And then Paramount invented a feud between her and Gloria Swanson, which Gloria, Paula, and Charlie Chaplin have all said was baloney. They actually didn't mind each other at all. Yeah, she was very, very famous. But probably her German stuff was more financially successful. What damaged her career was there were these Georgian I mean the country, not the state, noblemen, quote unquote noblemen, who made this habit of marrying Hollywood stars and spending their fortunes and bossing them around. That is part of what damaged her career. And also the sound revolution was happening and everyone was doing sound tests and she had retired and then she unretired. But she did make a successful comeback in Germany. But of course that couldn't last because you're a Polish actress in Germany. You kind of need to leave at a certain point. And she did. So I think her career, it was just like a multitude of factors. But it is true that she never really caught fire in America the way she really should have. And I'm not really sure if it was because people felt she was overhyped. I know some fan magazines, they wrote in and said they felt that, why are we importing Polish actresses when we have good American actresses? <laughs> kind of like that, which is a little silly. But I think it's like so many things. There's not one thing you could point to that damaged her career. It's just a multitude of things. And 
she never did quite as well as she could have in America. Well, before we kind of wrap things up, I did want to ask you, for people who are curious about silent films, who may be worried about watching them for the first time, or who maybe are trying to watch them and are struggling with it, do you have any advice for those people? The desire to get into silent films is in itself a really good sign because a lot of people won't even give them a try. So the very fact that people are trying it out shows that they have an open mind and are willing to make the attempt. And I think the main thing is just if you see one and you don't like it, try one that's totally different and try to find a high quality release because there are these like bargain basement releases where 99 cents, you'll get 5 million movies or something. And they're invariably scratchy prints, bad scores. So there's a website called silentera.com where they talk about the quality of different silent film releases. So I recommend going on that one and checking first to see which one is considered to be the best. And I actually have a curated list on my website. If you look it up, it's called Your First Year of Silent Films, where I take people on a tour trying to get show them as many silent films as possible. But when all else fails, I do recommend trying one of the comedians because comedy does seem to be more of the gateway. And even though I prefer silent drama, most people prefer comedy, so I would definitely give them a try. And go with what you like in sound. For example, if you really like Hal Roach comedies in the talkie era, watch some silent Hal Roach. Or if you saw the movie Chaplin with Robert Downey Jr., try out seeing some of the real Chaplin shorts. Because I often find people have an easier time with silent films if they can get some connection to sound. Or so if there's a movie you really like that's a talkie, and you find out there's a silent film original, try that one out too. Or if there's a book you really like and it's been ad adapted as a silent film, try that. So just keep trying, be persistent, and don't give up because there is a learning curve. You have to get used to the different style of acting, the different style of directing, and the way music is handled and the way title cards are handled. So, I mean, that's different. You have to acknowledge that, accept that. But once you get acclimated, it becomes much, much easier. For people who are curious about Barbed Wire, last time I checked, they did have some copies on Amazon. I think they were a bit low at the time. I don't know if they're going to restock or not. I hope they are. But you can get it through Grapevine Video. They are highly recommendable. Criterion does very good with silent film releases. Oh, what's the German one? Kino. Oh, Kino Lorber. Yeah, Kino does great ones. And then uh, Flickr Alley puts out some really fantastic stuff. And if you're interested in seeing one of those really violent anti-German propaganda films, they have one of the most infamous ones that's about to be released. It's called Behind the Door, and I'm very much looking forward to seeing that one. <laughs> and oh, oh, and what's the other one? Oh, Milestone is the other one that does really good high quality releases. You really want to make sure you get good stuff. And if you're worried about it, you look on Amazon or look talk to other people who know more about this then you might and i'm sure you'll find some good stuff out there okay well i do want to thank you for joining me today i greatly enjoyed our discussion thanks for having me on it was fun and if you're for people who are curious about the stuff that my dear guest does you can find her again at moviesilently.com she also has a twitter at movies silently and i hope you will join me for next month where the topic is going to be the Oscars, particularly the Best Picture nominations, and I hope to see you guys all then. See ya. You can find me on Twitter at CinemaPackRats. Links to my WordPress and YouTube account, where you can find film and television news and reviews, can be found in the episode's description. <laughs>